Hey, man, it's me, Kevin Smith. Are you listening to the right podcast? Because you're supposed to be listening to Three Guys in a Flick. Are you listening to that right now? Then you're in the right place. Enjoy. Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. The show is about to begin. Whenever I get gloomy with the state of the world, I think about the arrivals gate at Heathrow Airport. General opinion starting to make out that we live in a world of hatred and greed, but I don't see that. It seems to me that love is everywhere. Often it's not particularly defined or newsworthy, but it's always there. Fathers and sons, mothers and daughters, husbands and wives, boyfriends, girlfriends, and old friends. When the planes hit the Twin Towers, as far as I know, none of the phone calls from the people on board were messages of hate or revenge. They were all messages of love. If you look at it, I've got a sneaky feeling that you'll find that love actually is all around. Welcome back. You are listening to Three Guys in a Flick. This is where we review the good, the bad, and the absurd. Tonight is our second week of our holiday extravaganza, and tonight we will be talking about Love Actually. Beware, spoilers. Coming to you from one of the terminals at Heathrow Airport, my name is Don, and to my right we have our comic book guy, John. Ho, ho, ho. And to my left we have the professor, Ken. Hello, everybody. How are you guys doing tonight? Doing well. Doing great. Yeah? What about you? Oh, I can't complain. Yes, I, yes, you can. You do every week. Do I? Every week you I, complain. I just got back from a trip. It was a really good trip, and I think I'm starting to get a cold a little bit. I feel a little congested in, in the chesty. So you're feeling a little, like, sick, actually? <laughs> I like that. <gasps> I just thought of her name. Tonight is our second week of our holiday movies. Uh, last week, we reviewed Miracle on 34th Street, the original 1947 version. Classic. And tonight was the professor's pick, and he chose Love Actually. And I said this last week, listeners, we don't have any holiday movies in the Bronco helmet, so... This Cow- one's, cowboy up. Yeah, this one's kind of on you guys. So, uh, hey, professor, I gotta know, why Love Actually? I have to say, it is not part of my regular Christmas rotation. I have probably a half dozen movies that I watch every Christmas season, and for whatever reason, this is not in the mix, but the... Uh, the, the allure of having a movie for us to talk about uh, comes about because there are so many uh, uh, characters in the movie as well as well-known actors. There's a lot to talk about. Um, so obviously you'd seen it. Yeah, I, I've seen it several times. What about you there, comic book guy? Had you seen Love Actually? I had not seen it before. Oh, I love when we do that to him. Wait, what about the missus? Has she seen it before? She had started watching it at one point and turned it off. Wait, wait, wait. Let me guess. Let me guess. Let me guess. Let me guess why. She doesn't like their accents. No, she just couldn't get into the movie. We both felt that I think it was better done uh, back in, or in 2010 when Valentine's Day came out, directed by Gary Marshall. But this came out in 2003. I know. I'm just saying Valentine's Day took the same kind of idea, same premise, and I think they did it a little bit better. So you're forced to watch it. This is awesome. Mm-hmm. Did uh, Julie watch it with you this time, or was it just you? Because no, she remembered. she watched it all the way through with me. Wow! We watched it uh, from bed Saturday morning. Released on November fourteenth, two thousand and three, Love Actually was directed by Richard Curtis. It was written by Richard Curtis, and it stars Hugh Grant, Liam Neeson, Colin Firth, Laura Linney, Emma Thompson, Alan Rickman, Kira Knightley, Martine McCrutchen, Bill Nye. Rowan Atkinson, and a bunch of other actors. How'd this movie do, Don? This movie was made for $45 million and brought in $247 million. No, I was surprised with hearing, I mean, maybe it wasn't, some of them were as big at you know back then, but I was surprised that they got away with a $40 million, $45 million budget with such big names. Uh, a lot of these names weren't that big in 2003. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking must be. Because a lot of these people went on to do some pretty big roles. Andrew Lincoln alone went along, you know, went ahead and was the star of the Walking Dead series. Yeah, yeah. You know, at the time, Hugh Grant's huge, Liam Neeson, Colin Firth, and you know, all the upfront names are are big. But there were uh, a lot of 
character actors that who are bigger today than uh, than then. Like you were saying, Andrew Lincoln. You also had uh, Martin Freeman. I think Colin Colin Firth. He didn't really have big days until after this. He was a rising star at the time, you know. And I, I think that Liam Neeson certainly is your big name. Uh, Bill Nye, I, I think that he is a known British name. I was just wondering if Kira Knightley was she? Would you say she was a big actress at this time? No, because of Titanic. She wasn't in Titanic, but I like where your head's at. Oh no, Kira. Uh, I'm thinking of. Uh, so she really comes. Up, she really comes about courtesy of pirates. But I really liked her in yeah. Bend It Like Beckham. Yes, and she was, was. That was before. Yeah, she was fantastic in Bend It Like Beckham. And then Pride and Prejudice, and of course, Atonement. Yes. One of the highly rated movies here at Three Guys in a Flick. I think we all gave Atonement fives, right? Uh, pretty close. Yeah, that's what I thought. So going over the cast, what would you guys think of the casting of this movie? I thought it was great. I like British movies. Uh, I like movies that are set in England, and I like the just the the way it's different than it is here in America, if that makes any sense. Uh, I really enjoyed all of the cast. I'm a big fan of a lot of those people. Uh, Hugh Grant included? You know, Hugh Grant is kind of hit and miss with me. I think there are some roles that he's really great in, and there are some roles that I just, it's too much. Yeah, he just annoys the fuck out of me in some movies. Well, he plays the same guy pretty much in every movie. Any standouts in this cast for you? The little kid. The little kid? Sam. Sam. Yeah, he. I just want to call him Peter Pan. Is he in Peter Pan? He, I think, played Peter Pan in the uh, TV show. Uh, Was it that story show, that Disney show? Oh, I, I don't know. He might have. Uh, I know him from a know, bunch of stuff, really. I know him from nothing. For me, I think the two biggest standouts were Liam Neeson, who I think always does a fantastic job. He did kind of feel like maybe he was, you know, his taken character on a day off because uh, he's always so serious. Uh, but I did like to see him in this fatherly role. And then also Emma Thompson. Uh, I thought she played that, you know, the... The betrayed wife pretty well. I didn't realize, I guess, when she was cast in this movie, she was very underweight, and they actually had her wearing a fat suit during this movie. I would have never noticed. Me neither. Mm -mm. So what about you, Professor? Uh, Let's see. You know, I I think that they all stood out to me. Nobody more so than the others. Well, there you go. I I, I thought that the, uh, the writing of how the story unfolds has all of the characters spending some time on screen that I am able to follow their each one of their story arcs. And the, uh, the story arcs also have uh, where they kind of sort of pair up. You, you, you go back and forth between two stories for, uh, for a few minutes at a time on screen that I'm able to more or less track the, yeah, everybody's story. Let's talk about that for a second, the way this uh, film was put together. Did uh, Comic Book Guy, did the jumping around from story to story fuck you up? No, I actually was able to follow it, mostly. Yeah. Pretty amazing, because that's eight different stories. Eight Mm -hmm. different stories, yeah. I did struggle on uh, figuring out where people connected to other people. Yeah, I I don't know if uh, the connection is important to the story. First of all, I guess if there is one story theme about this entire movie, it's just love, right? Yeah. Um, but I don't know if them actually connecting would make a difference because it it, right. it doesn't do anything for it. When we see them all connected-ish at once, it's at the end at the airport. Right. And But that does nothing for our story. It didn't move us along. It doesn't, it doesn't do anything. Billy Mack is pretty much the only character that doesn't have any affiliation with the rest of the, the crew that we have. But he is sprinkled in there because he's on TV monitors or they're listening to him. Right. He is kind of our narrator without having a narrator. And what it is, is he makes that song that unites the uk right so every time we're in a scene and something's on tv it's the billy mac song or if you hear a song over the intercom when they're at the mall it's the billy mac song so i mean he's kind of kind of the glue i guess that holds this whole thing together but doesn't need to right and 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 the uh, the only other story arc um is with uh john and just judy they are they are friends 
for Jamie, but other than that, they don't seem to have a connection the way that we do with Jamie, with Daniel, Karen, Harry. And well, so- well, now you've just lost me. I, I didn't know any of these guys' names. Because mm-hmm. when I look at the screen, I say, that's Hugh Grant, that's Liam Neeson, that's the kid from that one movie. I, I had to have names in order to have me uh, anchor to being able to follow people. Sure. sure. I've got a question for you, Professor. Um, and I mean this in all seriousness. Uh, you've talked about what makes a Christmas movie and what doesn't make a Christmas movie. And you have certain priorities uh, for what a movie has to have to be a Christmas movie. Now, this movie obviously is filmed... Like Christmas is the background of the movie. It's a big point of the movie. But I was just curious what you would like, what is in this movie that you would criticize or characterize as making it a Christmas movie? So uh, I, I've talked about having three points. One, you need to have it primarily set during the Christmas season. Check. Another one, you have somebody that's directly related to Christmas. And then the third is having one of these possible themes where you have uh, faith, fear, family, generosity, or uh, redemption, or uh, love, or hope, where it's, a, it's part of this, the story arc. And so if you have two of these three points, and I think you have a Christmas movie. When I first started watching it, I was thinking to myself, why is this a Christmas movie? Uh, and, then the, the, <laughs> and then the title cards at the bottom. Five weeks until Christmas and a big Christmas tree. Okay, there you go. So Laura Linney, uh, I thought this was kind of a funny story, is when they were doing casting, uh, the director auditioned a lot of different British women, and he kept saying he wanted to find someone like Laura Linney. So eventually they just said, why don't we cast her? So I thought that was kind of just a funny little side story. And then the other thought, I, other thing of casting I thought was interesting was Billy Bob Thornton. Did you hear about his casting? No. He uh, was actually asked, or he accepted the part without ever reading the script because he was so flattered by an accompanying letter that was sent to him as part of the ensemble. Nice. There you go. The actress that plays Joanna, Olivia Olson, she had a very very uh, difficult time after the movie was over with. And she uh, ended up being bullied and people uh, really uh, were very, very uh, scrutinizing of her in general. And she ended up not doing pretty much any more acting. She was willing to do voice acting, but um, she had a very difficult time due to her success with this movie. It was very interesting. I thought for sure that she was not singing, but she actually did all of that singing for the movie. And they even asked her to tone it down because they thought that it was going to be something that people were going to say, ah, she's just lip syncing. Sure. But, but um, I, I was so impressed that much more so to find out that she really did all of that singing. She uh, got the part after they had been... They had been scrounging for months to look for somebody. They wanted somebody with the right look, with the right sound, somebody that could be believable, and eventually, you know, they found her. Right on. Let's talk about Bill Nye real quick and his Billy Mac rock star. What do you think of his character throughout this movie? He might be my favorite character. The fact that he is so outrageous, and yet he's still considered to be so lovable by the public you know, inside the inside the movie, it, it's ironic, but he's he's a, definitely a character. This, I mean, this was like the second time I've seen this film, and I love the bit when he they're interviewing him and he takes the pen and he dry he draws the word captions for that group, and he says we all have little pricks, but it's the reactions of the hosts to Billy Mac's character. Do you know who it's those hosts funny. are? Uh, probably hosts from a Britain show. They are the two, like, ho- main hosts of Britain's Got Talent. Well, now they are, but now back are. in 2003, they weren't. Were they just radio DJs, or what do you... I don't know, and, and I was noticing that as well, that, oh, hey, it's the guys from Britain Got Talent. Yeah. Apparently, this is what they do in real life. Yeah. Uh, There's I, a Britain Got Talent? Yep. 
Yeah, so well, that sh- shows you how much I know. They have them like in every country now. Uh, but I thought it was interesting to read that originally they wanted a r- actual rock star to play it. They were looking at Mick Jagger. They were looking at Sting, David Bowie, Peter Gabriel, others. And then they thought, no, these rock stars are just going to ask for too much. We're going to have to do too much for them. Uh, let's just get an actor to play it. And I think Bill Nye did a great job. He, For me, he was the, the most fun part of the movie and kind of holding it together. And I love the fact that we got this aged rock star who was just, like, he just didn't give a fuck anymore and was just being honest about everything. You know, about how much his song sucked, how much he hated it, how much, you know, he all the drugs he did, how crazy he was. I just, I just loved that, and the fact that it still took off after he was just blasting it. It was just a fun, fun role for him. Yeah. Is it trivia time? Well, yes, Don. It is your favorite Christmas present, trivia time. In our continuing pursuit to crown the master of movie trivia, I have prepared a series of questions related to the movie we are reviewing this episode. Please wait until I finish each question before answering. And we are getting close to the end of the year, so we're going to have to pick a master of movie trivia. So it's starting to get serious. The word actually is spoken how many times by various characters throughout the movie? 150. Four. 22 times. I was closer. (laughs) What is the name of Sam's mum? And Daniel's wife, whose funeral occurs at the beginning of the movie. Sarah. Joanna. It's the same as a little girl. Oh, that's right. Which of the girls who Colin meets in Wisconsin is the sexy one? I believe that's going to be Shannon Elizabeth, because we don't meet her. Harriet. Harriet. Uh, Very good. uh, That's the answer I was looking for. She's the one at the end, too. Which film do Sam and his stepdad Daniel watch? Titanic. Very good. What do Jack and Judy, the naked couple, make small talk about the first time you see them? Uh, just working on set? Uh, coffee? Coffee? They, they talk about traffic. Oh, traffic. Oh, that's right. He's stuck on the blah, blah. Yeah. That's right. Who does comeback rock star Billy Mack say was rubbish in bed? Britney, Britney Spears. Spears. Britney Spears. I thought that was kind of hurtful. Can you imagine Britney Spears watching the movie? Why? I don't know. What if she was rubbish? That's just, oh, ouch. I, I, I take that as a opportunity to learn and do better. Mm. Be better in bed, okay? Britney, thanks. What part does Daisy, Karen's daughter, play in the school nativity? A lobster. Octopus. Professor's right with the first lobster. How long has Sarah been in love with Carl? Two years, three months. And an hour and a half? And an hour and a half. You guys were really close. Two years, seven months, three days, one hour, and 30 minutes. And for the final question, which actor has a cameo as the president of the United States? Billy Bob Thornton. I think this round goes professor. I think you are in the lead. You might win the championship. Congratulations. I think it's fixed. I think you're going to win it anyway. So... Congratulations, Professor. You are truly a master of movie trivia. A voiceover opens the film, commenting that whenever he gets gloomy about the state of the world, he thinks of the arrival gates at Heathrow Airport, about the pure, uncomplicated love of friends and family, welcoming their loved ones. He also points out that the message from the 9-11 victims were messages of love and not hate. The story then switches between interconnecting love stories of many people. The movie opens with Billy Mack. He's in a recording studio, and he's trying to get his lyrics what did you think of him sitting there? I thought it was hilarious because he just had to change the word love to Christmas. Yeah. And he couldn't do it. And he just kept going over and over. And during this whole time, during the recording session, he was even like, ah, oh, this is shit. What the yes, fuck it, are we doing? It's all like gold shit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. You get the impression right away that he hates not only what he's doing, but just hates the song in general. Right. Right. And then we're given the card five weeks until Christmas. And then we jump into Jamie saying goodbye to his girlfriend, played by Colin Firth. 
and and we are thinking, okay, we're off to a good start here. Did they specify that that was his girlfriend, not his wife? Because that's was one thing I was wondering about near the end. Um, I took it as his girlfriend. I don't think they said that. Okay. Um, I don't know why I wouldn't think of it as his wife. I, I guess for me at that point, I what's the difference? Yeah. In in the context of a story, right? Well, for me, the difference was, uh, in five weeks, a divorce wouldn't have gone through. And yeah, that's what was you're, making you're me probably question. right. That's what was making me question at the end when he does what he does at the end. He's not even divorced yet. So if it's a girlfriend, that makes perfect sense. He just breaks up with her. Um, so that's why I was wondering if there was some context I didn't catch in the beginning. But I guess she's sick and can't go to the wedding with him. Right. Right. right so right. we have a really brief time with Billy Mack, and then we have this very brief time with Daniel. Oh, this is where we're meeting everybody. And so after that, then we move on to to uh, Colin, and we have and he is bopping around the office, dropping stuff off, and oh so briefly we get to see John and Judy, John and Just Judy working at as the porn stand-ins, and then we also have uh, Peter and Mac. They're standing at the altar, and in walks Juliet. Right after that, we get the Prime Minister meeting his staff, and we meet Natalie as well, and so. Bam, 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 bam. All these different characters right up front. You know, just a few moments where we are just oh so briefly introduced to them, where they're at in their life five weeks from Christmas. I don't know if I would call John and Judy the porn stand-ins. I think they were just body doubles for an actual movie. Yes, let's let's clarify that because that, <laughs> well, because that matters. Well, I don't, they just, they wasn't like they were making a porn is all I wanted to say. Okay. Because I think it, 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 I know it doesn't seem important, but if, I don't know if you caught it at the end. They had stayed celibate until they were married, and so the first time they were having sex wasn't on a porn scene, you know, whatever a film project was, you know, at the end of the movie. So okay, I just thought that was important for their storyline. Sure, sure. There you go. So the whole bit with the wedding where. Um, they have the the singing and then the instruments in in the church. How in the world do you not notice all these people with instruments sitting in in the church? Especially trombones and saxophones. How do you hide those? Totally. And the fact that so it it's like almost half, maybe not quite half, but it looks like a sizable chunk of the people that are at this wedding are musicians. Yeah. Julie brought up that point of a lot of them seem to come to from the bride side. She's like, did she lose a lot of invitations to be able to allow all of these musicians to show up? I I took it as the bride didn't even know. I, I like yeah. it was a complete surprise to her. Yeah. So. yeah, Peter had no idea. It was all Mark. I love that you know these guys' names cuz I'm watching this I'm going, well that's Karen Knightley and that's Andrew Lincoln, right? And uh, who's the husband? Peter? Mark? Which one is he? Peter is the husband. Mark is the best friend. Okay, so uh, Peter's real name is Chiafol something or other. Age of four? Uh, yeah, there you go. Yeah. Didn't we do a movie with him too? I feel like we did. I don't know. Because I feel like us trying to struggle through his name before. But anyways, that's how I looked at all of these characters, right? Oh, there's Laura Lenny. There's Hugh Grant. I think the only one I really knew was Natalie for some reason but my niece is named natalie so there you go did you guys notice that this movie uh opens with a funeral and a wedding on the same day the and and that's gonna take me to another point coming up which is we have uh these stories being bridged together by songs that you have so you you have the bay city rollers playing at the at the funeral Bye Bye Baby, and then we get over to the wedding reception and the same song is playing at the wedding reception at that time where they're talking about how crappy this DJ is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And they do that several times in in this where we have a bridge between two stories happening because of the music. Sure. Which is very intentional that the director did this. Right, right. It kind of, it, it quilts it together. At the funeral, are we led to believe that she has died of a long illness? It seems like everyone was prepared for her to pass away. That's kind of how I took it. Okay. Me too. You know, she, she's young. She also, because he had thrown out there that, you know, she had told him to move on and he said only if Claudia Schiffer shows up or something like that. Right, which is an ongoing gag throughout the film. It's also a little bit of foreshadowing. Yeah, 
Yeah, absolutely it is. Crack me up that this uh, outrageous story arc for Colin deciding to go to the U.S. because he's going to get women because of his accent and his and his buddy he's like no way you you are you are you are so out of your head on this and the fact that it actually comes to fruition at the end you know it's oh, <laughs> it's so funny i thought it was i thought it was com- comical and then he took a whole backpack full of condoms yeah yeah cuz all he was going to do when he got to the united states was have sex for his whole storyline uh julie and i were both convinced he wasn't coming home with a kidney we thought he was going to be one of those urban legend kidnap victims. Waking up in a bathtub. Yeah. In, in a Christmas movie. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Um, yeah, I, I liked his story. It was quick, simple, uh, and I liked the kid who played him. We also have, uh, we're, we're introduced to Alan Rickman uh, talking to, uh, so Harry, his name is Harry, and he's talking to Sarah about uh, her infatuation with Carl. I thought that the way he was just so direct with her was so amusing. Do you think he knows? Yes. Oh, my God. How, does everybody know? Yes. Uh, I love the fact that he keeps saying Carl. Anybody? 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 What was his brother's name in Die Hard? Carl. Yeah, there you go. Uh, I just thought it was interesting, too. It's kind of a sign of the times is I don't think a boss today could talk to an employee the way he was talking to her. Well, there were certainly some, some I, I think, uh, a couple of things that wouldn't be in today, you know, that we had 20 years ago. Mm-hmm. Fuck, that was 20 years ago, wasn't it? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Wow. Mind blown? Blown. Yeah, you're probably right. So. And then we come back around to Billy Mack. He is talking about his hit single, Christmas is All Around, and and he... <laughs> He drives his manager Joe crazy just with the auda- with his audacious comments that he makes about himself and the single and his manager. I love his reactions like when he's on the radio. Oh, it's complete rubbish. And it cuts to his manager. He's like, fuck, dude, what are you saying? Did you catch what he called the song? Rubbish. This is solid gold shit. Yeah. Uh, when does Jamie walk in with his brother and his girlfriend? Is this this bit? He is walking in on his brother and girlfriend before he gets to the wedding reception. He stops off at home to check on his his girlfriend slash wife. We don't know. Oh. And uh, at first, he thinks the brother is just checking in on her. Right. Until you hear from her background, her saying, I want to get in at least two shags before Jamie gets home. Jamie gets home. That's <sighs> just brutal. Yeah, I, I can't imagine something like that. Have we introduced uh, Hugh Grant's prime minister character? Oh, so briefly, yeah, we watch him pull up, and then and then he waves to everybody, then he walks inside, and then eventually he meets Natalie. And he just gets all the introductions. And he gets all smitten right away with Natalie. Yeah. Because he keeps talking to himself. I think that uh, one of my favorite phrases that Hugh Grant says, and he does it in every movie he's in, right. <laughs> whenever, whenever something happens where he doesn't know what to say or know how to handle it, it's always just... Right. I appreciated in that kind of scene when he first sees her and everybody kind of walks off that he, he makes some just little quick comment along the lines of, oh, not, this is not a good time for this now. Right. Yeah. I mean, he, he obviously gets smitten with her right away. And being the prime minister, how do you even go about that? Mm-hmm. Right. How, how does that even happen? That's immediately going to be a public scandal. Absolutely. Absolutely. Which is why I think he fires her or uh, redistributes her. Yeah. Redistributes yeah, yeah. her. Uh, what would you guys think of David and Natalie? I thought that they were sweet. And I don't know. I feel like this movie is classic Hugh Grant, where Notting Hill, where he's he's just all, he stumbles over his words. And, and he's not quite muttering, but he he's just this lovable doff. Yeah. And, and outside of a few films, I think you're right, Professor. I think he does play that lovable doffed character very well because he i thought his character in this even though it's supposed to be the prime minister was very reminiscent to his character in notting hill for sure the other thing with uh their storyline uh natalie was the woman's name Mm -hmm. the character's name uh did it bother you at any time that people were making fun of her weight throughout the movie. There was a lot of fat shaming going on in this movie. That's what I felt like. And they kept, because yeah. she's got a big ass and she's got big thighs. And I'm thinking, 
She looks perfect to me. I, I, I didn't think that she looked overweight at all. And, and the fact that the story arc has her being portrayed that way is just part of the story arc. Yeah, I, I mean, this is what it is, right? Mm-hmm. I didn't think she was large by any mm. stretch of the imagination. And I love, well, and then Bill Nye keeps calling uh, his manager a fat chubby. Buffed, so, yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there's a lot of fat shaming going on in this. But 20 years ago, man. Again, yeah, you bring up a good point. And then we're given a cue card four weeks until Christmas. As the story continues to move along, we touch again on the story arc of John and Just Judy. And we have uh, some some nudity happening now where he has to grab her breasts. I wonder what that is like as an actor. And you, you know, you're supposed to be doing this as a part of the story arc. And she's like... I don't know. It's got to be awkward. Keeping it professional. That that would be difficult. Yeah, maybe. I don't know. I mean, the act, the physical act of what they were doing seemed intimate and, you know, sexual. But the conversation they're having while they're doing it, I mean, I think that's got to play a lot into it, right? They're not talking dirty to each other. They're talking about traffic. And he's his hands are on her breasts. And Tony comes in and says, oh, can uh, you start massaging him a little bit? And he's like, yeah, okay. And they do that. And it, it, I just thought it was funny. I appreciate before he put his hands on her that first he's like, okay, well, let me warm him for you. Yeah. So <laughs> he's, been, he's been all professional. And then watching that, I don't know why, it made me think of like other movies I've watched that have had sex scenes or nude scenes in it and thinking, I wonder if this is what it's like, if they're just having conversations like this when they're filming and you know, trying to take out the awkwardness and it's just, it was, it seemed kind of another humorous part of the movie to me. And can you imagine like that that you're in this kind of position, this is, you know, your job and everything. And how do you ask someone out in that situation? Just like he did. Yeah. It just seemed kind of, kind of weird, but she was into it. Well, and kudos to the characters that they are written that way, that, that they are so innocent with each other. And the fact that we have this this gentle story that unfolds despite the fact that they have seen each other naked and they're doing sexual acts together-ish. We now have Colin. We touch on his story again. I bought my ticket. He's bought a ticket to Wisconsin. Of all places to go to in the United States. Fucking Milwaukee. Wisconsin. I just met a guy from Wisconsin. Real nice guy, though. So We have a, a brief bit where we have Harry and Mia talking, and he wants her to organize a Christmas party. And then uh, right after that, there's there's this moment where Daniel and Karen, Liam Neeson and Emma, they are talking about Sam, and we get this really cool camera shot that takes us up the stairwell up to the bedroom. It was... It, it, it was it was a beautiful shot where, you know, we're looking down and then we move up the staircase and then we see the closed door and we are left to wonder what's going on with Sam, who we are yet to meet. Right. Eventually he does, though, come clean is that he's in love, which is a, a curious place for him to be because Daniel has just lost his wife, who, you know, clearly, you know, he, he was in love with. Type and, of thing. Well, Sam's also lost his mother. Yeah. And I thought it was interesting, too. Uh, I wasn't sure why, like, they made him a stepson versus why couldn't he just been his regular son. Uh, and it was also a really big coincidence that his the girl that he was in love with shared the exact same name of his mother that he had just lost. So I, to me, that writing seemed a little bit weird, maybe unnecessary, but they were going for extra details, I guess. I, I don't know if it's extra details. I think that's just the way he wrote it. I don't think it matters that it's his stepson. I think it makes it more poignant if it is a stepson because as a stepfather, and you should know this, right? If something, God forbid, happened to your wife and Joey was at that age, I mean, you would you would be the man. Right? I, have, I have always told Julie, because she's asked me this question, what, what if something happened to her, what would my relationship be with my stepson, Joey? And I said, that all depends on what my new girlfriend thinks. <laughs> well played, I John. said, if they get along, he can stay. He can stay. <laughs> get an oh-so-brief moment where we see Sarah trying to talk to Carl, but it's still not happening. She is still uh, 
tongue-tied and refuses to acknowledge anything towards Carl. The guy who played Carl, uh, he was the guy from 300. Yeah. You know that? He plays I was Xerxes. wondering where I'd seen him before. Yeah. He's been in a bunch of stuff. We get to see Jamie on his own. We're not quite sure where he is, but he's sitting there in front of the typewriter at a house. And, right. and eventually I come to deduce he's in France. Yes. Yes. And then the lady who I guess owns the house or runs the house comes up and starts talking to him and says, this, this woman over here is going to be the one who's going to be taking care of you, take care of the house, whatever. And then Jamie falls or well, Jamie gets enamored. Well, not that it makes a difference, but I think, wasn't it Portugal that he was in? No, she, well, I don't know. I think know. she spoke Spanish. She, no, she spoke Portuguese. Portuguese? Yeah. And and he's speaking French. And Spanish. And, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't, I, th- I didn't think he really noticed her the first time because she looked very plain when they first met. It wasn't until she was cleaning up and doing things for him later that he started to, I felt like, started to notice her. Did you notice anything, Professor? Any spark between the two of them at the beginning? No, uh, all, all I, she just came across as feeling very awkward. Mm-hmm. And understandably so, because she's not going to most likely be able to talk to this person at all. And the fact that, you know, she's alone with him and he has to take her home, she's probably feeling, eh, you know, a, a little, a little gun shy here. You know, hopefully everything's fine. But, you know, if not, you know, this could be a situation Sure, sure. We do see a little bit more happening that a story arc is starting to evolve between David and Natalie, the prime minister, and his assistant. And he wants to get to know her a little bit. And she shares a little bit where she lives, where she lives, which is Wadsworth, and it's the dodgy end. And he is becoming a little bit more uh, friendly, I guess you could say, towards her and and she, in turn, is able to be candid with him as well. And is this where the uh, Billy Bob shows up? And the president has not shown up yet. Okay. No, but we are. I think we. I felt like we were given an impression at the beginning, at least, that Hugh Grant just is a people pleaser. He just wants to make everybody happy, uh, not rock any, you know, rock the boat, let it all create waves, anything like that. Uh, and so some people are kind of looking at him like maybe he doesn't have much of a backbone. Yeah, I kind of got that feeling too, where he's just kind yeah. of a yes, ma'am. His yes, cabinet, ma'am. yeah, his cabinet is asking for more, and he and he's like, he's, let's let's not, yeah, let's not shake the boat yet. But he's also with Natalie. He he shows this lovableness where she is explaining how her ex boyfriend was talking about her weight being an issue, and then as a prime minister, he well, I could. I could kill him. I could have him killed. I yeah, she's. Him ah, I think about that. Yeah, yeah. was I it guess, the SAS or yeah, something like that? I guess the perks. One of the perks of the job, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, that was good. That was good. What did you think of Daniel having his son's back? That you know, we're just a couple of weeks from Christmas, and he decides that he wants to become a musician and learn the drums in a couple of weeks. I, I have to say, I really appreciated their relationship, and I really appreciated uh, Liam Neeson. I'm so used to Liam Neeson being that guy who says, "I have a set of skills." And I will find you. Oh, right? That voice is so distinctive because it, of that. Yeah, absolutely. I agree. But for him to human down, and actually this comes out way before taking or anything. And uh, just to see him as a human being and a loving stepfather, I think, is is very important. And I love how he just listened to the kid. He just listened to him and, and he says, uh, Sam says, I'm in love. And he says, you're too young to be in love. And the kid says, Why? And then he goes, oh, well, yeah, I guess you're right, you know. Mm-hmm. And then for him to say, uh, and then Sam says, I want to start playing the drums because I want to impress Joanna. Uh, Liam Neeson's character is all about it. And mm-hmm. I, I, I think their relationship is one of my favorite in the film. I, I felt like for both of them, this gave them a project that helped them move on. Yeah, kind of uh, like a healing process. Yeah, because... They, you know, right in the beginning, they're both just focusing on the loss of Joanna. And, I, you know, the discussion that Liam Neeson has with uh, Emma Thompson basically saying that, uh, you know, he's having troubles moving on. He even breaks down crying at one point. Uh, but the whole time he used focused on helping Sam, you know, get his love interest, you can see a smile coming back to his face. So I, I really appreciated that that connection that they're making yeah Mm -hmm. yeah i agree three weeks until christmas and at this point we are we are having a couple of uh 
things progressing. We have Peter talking to Mark, and he wants to put Juliet on the phone, and she wants to come over and look at his videos because she thought the stuff that she had was rubbish. And so we're talking about Kira Knightley and Andrew Lincoln's characters, right? Yep. And then right after this, we have Harry asking Mia about how's the party coming along, and that's where Mia, she opens up her legs. It's just like, oh, my gosh. You know, middle-aged man having to put himself through the ringer and dealing with an openly flirtatious woman. Terrible. Yeah, but we've all been there. No, the younger women hitting on us all the time. We have the U.S. president arriving now, and he is pushing his policies that we're going to do it our way, and you're going to do it our way. And what I kind of uh, appreciated about this movie is we didn't have to get into specifics. We didn't have to get into details. The point was the president wanted to do it his way, and Europe was going to be on board. And for the most part, uh, David is like, yeah, we're not going to rock the boat. We're going to do what the Americans want, and it's going to be all good. It's not until... He sees the president coming on to Natalie. Right. He walks in on them. Which paints us Americans in a very bad picture. Totally. But not necessarily inaccurate. I was going to say, it's not. True that. It's not unbelievable. Right. So, anyways, uh, I think that's what flips David's decision. And Mm. then he sees. I kind of think so, too. And then he sees Natalie walk away. And he was like, oh, wait, I like her. She's uncomfortable. And and he's like, what the, the fuck did this dick do? Right. And so they go out to the press conference. The, the president podiums, says yep. something. And then and then David shocks the UK. He stands up to Billy Bob and says, you know what? We may be small, but we're still fucking awesome. And we're going to do it our way. And you better get used to it. Get on board with us. That's what, Yeah, that's right. Uh, now, this I thought was kind of weird. Uh, I was trying to figure out what was going through David's mind at the point, whether or not he was trying to figure out was Natalie flirting with the president too? Like, were they flirting with each other? Was he just coming on to her? When he has her later on uh, move to another department or whatever, I was thinking either he was doing it for one or two reasons. One, he thought there was a little bit of flirting going on and he just didn't want to be, it was hurt too hurtful to be around, too distracting to be around her. Or two, to protect her from that happening again. Did I... You? I took it as, uh, yeah, he saw the flirting, but I don't think he thought she reciprocated it. Okay. Because her her body language. Exactly. She looked a little panicked. And and Billy Bob came across as a fucking dick. Yeah. So, okay. Yeah. Trump, right? That that was our, back in 2003, would they call that foreshadowing? Maybe. Uh, But I think he redistributes her is because he has feelings for her and it would be inappropriate. That's what I think. I think that's the only reason why he does it. Yep. That's what I think. We get one little story arc connection that right after the prime minister, you know, makes his public declaration, Karen calls David. Oh, my God. You know, it's your sister on the phone. Oh, okay. So these characters are now connected by family. Right. Well, I really like, you know, during the speech that uh, David was giving, I loved Billy Bob Thornton's expressions of like, what the fuck did you just do? It it, it was if looks could kill. I mean, he gives that. That was a death glare that mm-hmm. he's giving. And, and Billy Bob's kind of good at that stare, mm-hmm. right? It doesn't change up the entire fucking sequence. But, yeah. Then we have one of the more iconic moments of the movie. You have the Prime Minister dancing to the Pointer Sisters. This was one of the scenes that I think... Yeah, I have a few scenes on my list of just what annoyed me or bothered me. I really, for some reason, this really turned me off in this movie, this dance scene. And even Hugh Grant himself says that's the scene he hated most in the movie because he doesn't see a prime minister, someone in that role, just dancing around like that. Well, then I feel bad for both of you because it doesn't matter if you're the president of the United States, prime minister, or God herself. If you feel the urge to dance, dance. And that's my stance on it. So, there you go. The the whole dance routine is certainly uh, amusing. Hugh Grant really wanted to skip the the routine, and he was reluctant to do it right up until it, nope, we're doing it. And he's like, 
okay, he put on his big boy pants and, and he started dancing. And I, what I found amusing was the fact that he makes his way all the way downstairs and we have the music, but there's no music da- on down there. I was thinking about that too. And if I had to pick anything out of this whole sequence, it would have been that. And it's just for a brief moment, yeah. right? Because we, the audience here, the Pointer Sisters, right? We're jumping yep. all about it, right? And then as he comes down the stairs and he sees that gal, the music stops and he explains whatever. And I'm right. thinking- it- Wait, there was no music to begin with. So is did he have that music in his head? And then I thought, oh fuck, I don't care. Yeah. Anyway, it's it's an amusing moment in the movie. Yeah. Two weeks until Christmas. And now we have Jamie and Aurelia. They start sort of chatting to each other. And it's unclear if they actually understand each other because they're talking to each other without necessarily communicating with each other. Sure. They're saying similar things. And it was really nice to have those subtitles. I I like that bit. I like where he says, uh, where they're pretty much talking about the same thing, but she's saying something different. Yeah. So, for example, like... uh, He'll say, oh, I'm a really good driver. And she'll say, but you're a really bad driver. You know, and just the context of the conversation. Mm -hmm. I thought that was cute writing. I thought it was a great job of illustrating how both of them were starting to get on the same wavelength. Yeah, yeah, good point. Very much so. That there was a connection between the two of them. Because even though they weren't understanding a word the other person was saying, they were still talking about the same things. Yeah. He offers the pastry, and then she declines, and she's she's commenting that you shouldn't eat that because you're just going to get big. Another weight issue. Oh, yeah, another (laughs) another fat shaming. Love actually. Is this this where the lake scene happens? Yes. Yes, and so then... And this is one of the this is one of the the longer sequences where we actually stay with our characters for more than just one or two minutes. This is this, I don't know. It's got to be at least five minutes. But yeah, then we go to we go outside where the typewriter's outside at the dock, and she comes out with the cup and she lifts the cup off. And <laughs> there goes all the papers. I love how she says, "What kind of fool doesn't make copies?" And then he goes, "Oh, I wish I made copies." I like the, where he's in the water and he says. Uh, I hope we get out of here soon because I'm afraid there might be eels in here. And she's like, well, watch out for the eels. Yeah, she says, don't disturb the eels. Uh, did you know that that lake was only two feet deep and they had to actually get on their knees and pretend like they were swimming? No, no. Yeah. Acting, man. They did a great job. Yeah. I was thinking, who the fuck uses a typewriter? We are actually in 2003 here. I kept thinking, who has a stack of paper outside by a lake? With the wind. With the wind and all that. Yeah. So he kind of... Hey, what he, he kind of got what he deserved. Hey, man, it's his method. Yeah. All right, all right. Did it's they his... not have laptops back then? Yes, oh, they did. They had cell phones. So when they're back inside, they're really working hard to communicate with each other and to talk about his book. She's trying to figure out what kind of a book is it. You know, is it a mystery? Is it a thriller? Or what is it? And and, and so it, I, I just thought that it was genuine interest on her part to want to know more about him rather than he's just my employer. Right. The one last little tender moment that we have between uh, Jamie and Aurelia is he talks about his favorite part of the day, and it's her saddest part of the day, Mm -hmm. the drive home. I thought that was a really cute scene. And then we have Juliet stopping by Mark's place. Oh, look, here's your video right here. You know, she finds the video almost immediately. And, oh, my gosh. I thought it was funny. VHS? And then I'm watching it and going... Did he have time to cut that together? What's going on there? I had a feeling that that was a little side project. He had cut it together. And even the music that was playing, I thought maybe he had added the music to the soundtrack. And that's where she's like, he put some effort into it and it's all on me. Well, I mean, was there music or was that the music from the movie at the same time? I, I, I was trying to think that that was the music that he coordinated with the, the movie. And that added an, even another element to it that she was like, oh... I just figured this out. Right. That's what I kind of... How awkward. How awkward to be (laughs) exposing yourself like this. And now she's going... She's never going to unsee any of that. Mm -hmm. That the fact that he has this massive crush on his best friend's girl. Right. I kind of like the way that they closed out the scene where, you know, she comes to the epiphany. You know, you don't like me. You don't talk to me. It's because he's enamored with her and loves her. and Yeah, the prime minister decides to have Natalie redistributed. And we, we, all, we already briefly talked about that. But I have to say that 
I, I think that that is essential for the story arc because if he does not have her go, then he can't go get her back. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. And if he redistributes her and decides that he does love her and does want to start something with her, it's not a conflict of interest. Mm-hmm. Right? Mm-hmm. I mean, he he's following the proper channels, I guess you She's could say. She's not Monica under the desk is what you're saying. We flash back to Jamie and Aurelia. Their time is coming to a close because he's heading back to be with family for Christmas. And they are clearly sad, and she kisses him. So Billy Mac's Christmas video inspires Sam to learn to play the drums for the Christmas concert. So that way he can woo Joanna. He got pretty good pretty quick. But That's I guess totally when, what I thought. when love inspires you. Yeah, I suppose. I did like the messages on the door. I thought that was a cute little gag. So did I. Uh, when he knocks on the door and he says uh, something about, uh, you know, I'll, I'll eat later. And then he's like, no, I knock on the door. And he's like, look at the sign. It says, I said I'll eat later or something like that. Mm-hmm. We are now at the Christmas party where Mia confronts harry and she lets him know it's for you it's all for you oh my god terrifying yeah terrifying absolutely i gotta say that if i had something like that happen to me it would eat me up inside my wife would have she would easily know that something was up because i cannot i cannot hold it together i I would be so wrought with guilt and anxiety sure Absolutely. And I think he is too, to a certain degree, but then he starts to play into it. So he is seduced into it. He, yeah. Thank you. That's a great word. He was seduced into it. I don't know why, but it seemed to remind me of the original vacation movie when uh, Clark is kind of hitting or flirting with the uh, Christy Brinkley character. It was like the non funny version of that whole relationship of. Here's this younger woman, this cute girl who's flirting with him and he's not so much, you know, flirting back as much, but still is obviously has some interest there. Mm -hmm. We have the, we have a Kelly Clarkston song playing the trouble with love is where that's what they're dancing to. And then it takes us over to the prime minister and he's listening to the same song, but eventually it does segue to. Billy Mac on TV, where even the Prime Minister is laughing about Billy Mac. Well, we we also have a scene during that dance scene, Alan Rickman with Emma, Emma, that uh, Emma Thompson's character looks over, and you can see she's starting to put the dots together. She, yeah, she... She's feeling very uncomfortable, that uh is for sure. Uh Mm -hmm. But I I like how her mind, because she even talks to him about it, she goes to first of, you need to be careful with this, because this girl's obviously got interest in you so you're gonna have to you're not so that you don't get in trouble you're going to have to end this Mm. yeah she's not suspecting any cheating at this point let let her down easily yeah so you have this one dance that's happening where it's like uh uh-oh but then we have another dance that's happening between sarah and carl oh that's right and then they go back to her flat and that that little happy dance that she does right around the corner so sweet until did her did her flat feel like a dollhouse like a giant dollhouse no it felt like a fl- it looked like uh bridget D- jones's flat oh, i just felt like she lived in a giant dollhouse well maybe that's what they're like in britain maybe i don't know would you guys have answered the phone in her situation i think she has to mm. but, and and this is what we're introduced to we have songbird playing and it is so poignant with the lyrics and how this is unfolding it's now brought to a head why she has issues that she is unwilling to commit. She has a brother with serious disability. Right. With a serious disability. Right. And he calls, and her and Carl stop what they're doing, and no, she no, takes I'm the call. No, no, I'm not doing anything. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not. I'm not busy. Yeah. And so for Carl, he's like, well, fuck. <laughs> right? Um, but this is where we find out this is Laura Linney's path. Yeah. And... Yeah, it doesn't really go anywhere. All she had to do was ask the hospital to up his tranquilizers for like the next 10 minutes and she was good to go. There was a great camera shot right at the end where she is sitting on the floor next to her bed and Carl is sitting uh, at the foot of the bed facing us. And then it segues to Harry and Karen's bed where they're unwinding after the party. Right. Anyway, it was it was a really nice little transition there. Also at this time, we have Mia undressing. What the fuck is this doing right here? 
for us, the audience, it's it's clearly showing Mia in a, a, a bad light. The fact that we have Karen telling Harry, you better be careful there. And then it's a shot right after this of Mia and she's undressing and she looks all sexy and she walks off screen. I remember thinking to myself, yeah, what is the point of this shot? I mean, she's pretty. Yeah. And, you know, I, I guess you, I- you wouldn't turn away, but in the context of what's happening and what we're watching and in the story, I'm not sure what that added. So, yeah, I was reading an article with Richard Curtis, uh, and he said that, uh, he was approached to remove all of the nude scenes and all of the sexy scenes kind of like that from it. And he said, he thought in the back of his head, you know, when he was younger, that's one of the reasons why he went and watched movies is for things like that. And he, his younger self would be very upset with him if he removed any of that. So he committed that he was keeping all of those kind of things in the movie for people who, who like to take a look at those kind of things. <laughs> Thanks, Richard Curtis. Yeah. Circa 2003. We have Sarah now visiting her brother, and we get to see what it means for her to be present for her brother. Right. And it it all, you know, when she first gets the phone calls and stuff, I thought it was like uh, she was a personal assistant to someone famous or she just a personal assistant to someone. Right. I, I thought it was her boss. Yeah. I, yes. And I didn't realize it was family until she gets to the place and, and visits her brother. And this is the bit where he tries to hit her, too. Right. And yeah. she catches it like she's a fucking pro and she's been doing this forever. And it, she's it, like, don't do that. And it yeah. just, it's, it's kind of heartbreaking. It, mm-hmm. it totally is because you see the you see uh, the person zip out from the office and very passive, very quiet, doesn't yell or say anything. And then the only conversation that happens, it happens from her. And, and she's like, don't do that, my darling. Yeah, just, just don't. Of all the stories, you know, I tried to watch for it. Hers is the one that really doesn't resolve. She just ends up with her brother at the end, isn't she? Yeah. No love, no Carl, no nothing. It's not the only one that doesn't resolve. Okay. But we'll get there when we get to the airport. Okay. Harry has decides he's going to take off and do some Christmas shopping, and me is like, what are you buying for me? And then he was like, well, what are you getting for me? Well, right. But the fact that he calls her. I know. Well, yeah. she gets in his head. Yeah. And uh, she, I thought this bit was kind of comical when he goes to buy her the necklace, and it's Rowan Atkins. Mm-hmm. And Mr. The w- Bean. And the way he's opening the drawer, getting the flowers, getting the petals. Did you, I thought that was funny. Did you read uh, the side story that they cut out involving Rowan Atkin? I did not. He, You notice he appeared in two places in this movie. He appeared in this scene where he was doing it very slow, almost seemed like on purpose. And then he also appeared at the airport where he gave a look, where he served as a distraction. His character really was supposed to be a Christmas angel. He was supposed to be there to interact with different characters to help them on their, the correct path. Yeah. I kind of picked that up after we saw him in the airport. Yeah. And in the guest, there was a scene that was filmed uh, near the end of the movie where we were supposed to see him walking down a street and he was just going to fade away. That would have been a bit much. Yeah. So then they ended up cutting that whole story out. But the whole gift wrapping bit, it, it's just so good. You know, just one another thing and another thing. What are you going to do? You got to dip it in yogurt? <laughs> Cover it with chocolate buttons? Just one more thing. Yeah. You must have the cinnamon. One week until Christmas. So Colin shows up at his buddy's flat because he's renting his own flat out and he's got a backpack full of condoms and he's headed off to America. What the fuck? <laughs> he can't be serious. But he is. Dead serious. And... It fucking works. I know, like I said, when he got off that plane, when take me to just the, the closest bar and walks in the bar, I really did think, like I said, these women were going to pick him up and do something to him. He was going to say, I had a great time, but I lost the kidney. But that doesn't fit anywhere within yeah. the motif of the story. Did you think he was really going to just bed up with four women? Absolutely not. It's so preposterous. But he does. I know. We have John and just Judy. John finally musters the courage to ask her out. You know, she's got her thighs right over his face, you know, and they're like, oh, my God. Oh, like if she was sitting on his face? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But, yeah, he finally musters the courage to ask her out. Sam continues to practice the drum. He sounds like he's getting better. 
we have a real quick cut where Karen finds the necklace in Harry's jacket. Heartbreaking. Oh my gosh, so bad. And well, she gets excited because she thinks it's for her. Yeah, but we all know that it's not for her, and we know that that is coming. We get a quick cut of the Central London School of Language where Jamie is learning a new language. Which I thought was adorable. Karen finds Harry's Christmas card. Sorry, I'm such a grumpy bugger, bad Harry. And so it, it's it's very brief. We get a bunch of quick cuts that happen. So, you know, Colin says goodbye to his buddy to the airport. He shows up in Milwaukee, and he wants to go to just an average American bar. <laughs> And so, oh my God, are you from England? Yes. Hi, I'm Stacy. Oh my God, just so ridiculous. But I, funny. I like the part where they're going through, and what do you call this? And what do you call that? And he's like, "That's a straw. That's a cup. That's a." Table. And they're all they they repeat them. They all go, "Oh." And then like know. one of them sounds English or American, and he's there like, "Oh." Wait until Carol Ann gets here. <laughs> She's crazy about English guys. Why didn't you come back and sleep at our place? Hey, man. Yeah, but we only have one small bed. That we all have to share. And it gets pretty hot, so we have to sleep naked. Yeah. And there's a fourth one? <laughs> so Harry and Karen, they're opening only one present tonight. Devastating. When we get that reveal that the necklace is not for Karen, and she comes to the realization, and she has to excuse herself. Gut wrenching, uh, but a Joni Mitchell CD is a good consolation prize, isn't it? I would say yes because they had a conversation about it, and he actually listens. Mm -hmm. All right, you take the necklace thing out of it; it could have been a very powerful present. Could, could have been. been, but the necklace overshadows it because, well, <laughs> she thought she was getting that, and immediately, I'm sure her mind goes straight to the dance yeah, yeah. and all of that, and. Oh, there is something going on here. Sure. And the lyrics, both sides now of the song playing, just it's just soul crushing watching Karen's, you know, the character, you know, come to this realization that, you know, she is seeing both sides of love now in so far as, you know, she is devastated. Mm -hmm. And oh, it 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 just hurts so much. You go from having the perfect life to this isn't so perfect. And she's got to pick herself up and, you know, she has to get back to her family. Daniel and his son sitting there talking and the whole Claudia Schiffer bit. No, if, if that happens, then yeah, I'm, we're going to have sex in every room, including yours. Including yours. I love right. that. That was good. Billy Max song. It hits number one on Christmas Eve. Well, I love that he had said beforehand uh, that if his song made it to number one, he would perform on New Year's naked. So, yeah, there it is. Now it's Christmas Eve, and his song hits number one, and that was just such an amusing scene. So Christmas Eve, this is where a lot of these things come, kind of come to a head. Yeah. yeah. We have the prime minister finally deciding he loves Natalie, and he's going to go find her. And but he doesn't know her exact address, just the street she lives right, on. Right, so he has to search all of the houses. And we have John and Just Judy, they finally tenderly kiss, uh, you know, at her mother's flat. Right. Right, right outside. And uh, Jamie shows up to his family. I can't be here. I have to go now. <laughs> Something hits him. He drops off the fucking presents. I hate and, Uncle Jamie. Yeah, yeah that's what, Did yeah. you catch all the things that they were yes. saying? I yeah. hate Uncle Jamie. <laughs> Sarah and Carl wish each other a Merry Christmas at the office. It's just the two of them. And it's it's very bittersweet. You can tell Carl wants more, but it it's not going to change. Not yet. It's not going to change. I was kind of hoping that that story would resolve with Carl being a little more sensitive about it. That Carl said, "Why don't we both? Why don't you go introduce me to your brother?" Or just something where he kind of inserts herself himself into being her support since she is so supportive of her brother. We have Otis Redding, uh, "White Christmas." It's being played, and then we get a real quick touch of each one of our story arcs. It starts with Sarah and Carl. Then we see the prime minister by himself. We see Daniel and Sam together. Sarah is visiting her brother. They have the little Santa hats on. Peter and Juliet, they're at home, and it's the doorbell. And it turns out, oh, it's carolers. One of the more poignant moments in the movie that has been parroted a bunch of times. Sure. What would you think of that scene? 
I thought it was a clever way to talk to somebody. And it, like you said, it's been parodied a million times. What's the point? He does it just to tell her that she's perfect. And also, I think, to kind of sort of clear the air between the two of them. What, what, did, what did he clear exactly? What was the hope? What was the outcome he hoped for is what I was thinking. That he is acknowledging that he has feelings for her, that he is not going to do anything to jeopardize the relationship between her and her husband. Does he say that in those cards? No, he doesn't say, those, say that in those cards. He but, just tells her that she's perfect, yeah. right? Mm-hmm. I mean, basically, right? I mean, that's yeah. okay. And basically admits right to her because he never really said it at the other place. Yeah, I'm in love with you. Yeah, no, he jets as soon as that video is done. He leaves, yeah. right? He even says, show yourself out. So, so, yeah, maybe he's, but why do that? For me, it seemed like there was two possibilities there. One, he was basically admitting everything to her because maybe there was a possibility for them, which to me makes him the biggest dick in the world to his best friend. Uh, the other possibility is you, what you were saying, Professor, is that he was ca- you know, basically creating closure for himself because at the very end of the scene, after she runs out into the street and gives him a kiss, he basically says, okay, well, that's enough of that. Now I can move on. Uh, and so I thought maybe he is just acknowledging it and saying, yes, I'm in love with you. Yes, I acknowledge it. You're not just crazy. I don't hate you. Uh, but... You know, this is something I just need to say so I can close the book on this and everything. Again, though, I feel like even if he's just doing it to get the closure, he's still putting it in her head, which is the wrong thing to do. But his hand was forced when she finds that video that he mm-hmm. cut together. Yeah. Because before before that, he was just standoffish and cold towards her. Right. It was easier for him to do that. Mm-hmm. So. Next scene we get is we have... Billy Mac showing up at Joe's flat. And I got to say that, you know, when I first watched it and he's professing his love, I it, when I first watched it, I thought, oh, does that mean that he's gay? That's how he took it initially. But, but I struggled with that scene to try to figure out what they were trying to say. But now I understand that it's, you know, it, it's just that they have a strong fondness for the, for each other that's strictly platonic. Yeah, I, I figured either he was expressing his attraction to him or he was basically just saying, you are my family. I love you like family. That's how I take it because he's so, you know, he, he lives the rock and roll lifestyle that he has nobody that he can settle down with and just be, you know, be comfortable yeah. with. I do like, uh, do they ever, what's the name of his manager? Joe. Joe. He's like uh, five minutes at Elton John's place and you come back gay. Exactly. And so that's that's where we know that, that's how I take it, that it's yeah. a platonic relationship. I also do think that if you watch Joe's expressions, he really did think the first, when, when Billy Mac started talking, that he really was professing his love for him, his sexual attraction love for him, because he was like, oh my God, what am I going to do about this? I'm, you know, He looked like he was in panic mode. But then I think as it went on, he realized, oh, he's just saying that I'm his, the closest friend, the closest family he has. What did you think? I think he is in love with him. I think that they are in love with each other. And the comment he makes, uh, he says, now let's go find... Let's get drunk and watch porn. Right. And I think he really does, in fact, love Joe in all senses of the word, even sexually. And I'm like, I don't fucking care. Who cares? Love is love. Mm -hmm. Love actually is just love. I got the impression that uh, he was channeling kind of a David Bowie type character do you guys know the history of david bowie at all nope he was uh, fairly sexually ambiguous throughout his whole career yes he had you know i think he was married to a mon uh and he had a wife and everything but there's also well known that he went both ways so i kind of got that impression uh that that's kind of what maybe billy mack was a little bit modeled after especially near the end of david bowie's career oh sure i i would agree with that a hundred percent yeah, he. I think he was definitely playing for both teams. Mm-hmm. Not that there's anything wrong with that. No, I don't not at all. Fuck. So when Billy tells Joe that he loves him, I think it's actually I'm in love with you. I've yeah. always been in love with you. You're you're my guy. Well, one so. of the one of the things with Billy Mac's storyline, if you notice from start to end, is throughout the movie he's completely honest. His song sucks. Yep. He hates with he basically hates where his life's at. Uh, he feels like he's a washed up rock star, and in the end, he admits flat out. 
I'm in love with you. Right. So he was probably the most honest character throughout the whole movie. Next scene we have is the prime minister discovering Natalie's Christmas card of all things. And she and Natalie in the card professes fondness for the prime minister. I thought this was a really interesting thing. And I noted something about this was back when we had the flirtation between the secretary and her boss, she said, I'm all yours. And to me, that was just like an evil statement from a hussy woman trying to break up a marriage. But yet now we have it where uh, Natalie has written almost the same thing in a card saying, I'm yours. Uh, and it's the complete opposite. It's a very romantic, it's a very you know, loving kind of thing to say. So I love how they kind of turn that completely around. And then next thing you know, the Pointer Sisters song starts again, and he is determined, right now, I'm going to go get Natalie. Right. And eventually, he finds her. I love how you had to sing Christmas carols and yeah. knocking on all the doors. So yeah. what's the deal that he is so impulsive with this? He could get her records. She used to work for him specifically. Well, we're, where's, one, one phone call. Where's the fun in that for the movie? And, and where's the love? And right. Everybody's off on Christmas Eve, so he would have had to bring people back into work. So what? He's the prime minister. He could have. The point is, he could have done however he needed to. But do it's it. not a cute Hugh Grant scene, right? So he goes and he eventually finds her, and you her know, entire the, family. The family's there, and where the fuck is my fucking coat? She talks like that around those little kids. Who doesn't? Um, Have you seen Don around his kids? And so it turns out that they're actually leaving. They, they're they late for a school play. Which is, again, tying everything together. And uh, gives them a lift to the concert. And in the lift, uh, the octopus is sitting between David and Natalie. And it is decided that, you know, I probably shouldn't go in there. I'm the prime minister. I don't want to take anything away from the kids, blah, blah, blah. And uh, Natalie's like, wait, hang on for a second. She runs in and she says, we can watch from backstage. And now we have our story. We have different storylines converging. Uh, so Daniel, he, he, we also have Daniel at this point. He's leaving the airport in a taxi. And then we have David being snuck into the concert. And that whole bit with Karen running into him. I loved that scene. I loved just the, the the happiness, the relief on Karen's face when she sees her brother. Yeah, because she's carrying a burden that she can't share with anybody, and she knows eventually she will be able to share it with David. But at that moment, you know, she just, that's what I get out of that scene. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That, yeah. That hug. And that yeah. first thought of, you, he's, he's here for me. Yeah, yeah, that too. And he's like, oh, yeah, I'm totally here for you. Yeah, which he wasn't. Yeah, but... Whatever. It's but a, politicians lie. It's such a good emotional payoff. And then we have All I Want for Christmas, that, that number where we have <laughs> over the top, holy cow, that's quite the concert that a school puts on. Yes. Well, it is Britain. Um, another Mariah song that I personally think is completely overplayed, but what do I know? You and everyone else. Yeah. Well, this is the second movie with another overplayed Mariah song we've ever viewed. Was it, did it do anything? Like, was it heartbreaking at all when uh, Joanna turns around and she points at Sam, you know, all I want is you, and then turns around and starts pointing at everybody else and you can kind of see a little bit of heartbreak on Sam's face? That's not heartbreak, that's anger. That's was jealousy. That's all jealousy. He oh. gets all kinds of pissed off. And I was laughing so hard because I've been that 12-year-old, 11, however old he is, being extremely jealous. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was funny. I thought I, that, was, I thought that was a great touch. By the I noticed his his drum playing either got harder at that point or it stopped or something. It changed at that point. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it, but it is very amusing because he's on top of the world and now he's like you no right. This is right. so fast. Right. The whole little bit about the curtain opening to find Karen and or Natalie and David smooching right. You, that obviously, everybody knew that that yeah, was going to happen. Yeah. You, you saw it coming, and then. We have uh, the next scene that is, oh my gosh, Karen asking Harry, what would you do? What would you do if you were me? And then she goes through the different scenarios about their relationship with each other. Well, let me ask you guys this question, and I'll give you the answer afterwards. Uh, <laughs> do you think Harry had a sexual relationship with that, that secretary? 
I didn't care. Or did it stop at the jewelry? I I, I didn't care because the, the damage was already done, that Harry had already given in to somebody else. And bought the jewelry? Yeah. Did you care at all? No. Okay, well, the writer uh, has basically said, because it's, I guess there was some debate on whether or not what degree it actually went to. The writer has wrote that, yes, he did have a sexual relationship, but they decided to stay together and work it out. So, you know, having having that moment, it, it is just such a down moment. What's the next scene? The next scene we have is Daniel being totally pumped for how great Sam was in the production. He's like, yes! He is so happy for his son at that mm-hmm. moment. And it, it is so... F- it is so poignant in the story that we have these incredible highs and incredible lows, you know, right next to each other. Right. And then he, uh, Sam says it's too late and no, you got to tell her, you got to tell her. And so Sam's like, okay, I'll go tell her. But next thing you know, she's gone and they got to go and he goes for it. I, I think this shows Daniel being, uh, the greatest dad alive, right? Taking his kid to the airport to profess his love to a girl and he's what, twelve years old? Was it right before this? Right before they left, that they run into Claudia Schiffer? Yes, yes. No, that's at the airport. No, no, I think no. Oh no, you're it's right. At it's the at the school because right. I think she works at the school. But or... she's not Claudia Schiffer. No, she's not. She's Claudia Schiffer playing. Yes, somebody. yes, yes. yes, yes and yes, yes. you know, she got paid like two hundred thousand dollars for that scene for being in that movie. Yeah, maybe she was big at the time. Uh, but uh, I thought that was obviously a cute little cameo kind of thing. But that, I think that was supposed to show that there was a kind of that spark of interest in Liam. Yeah. So they all go to the airport, and I I think this is probably my favorite bit of the movie is Daniel getting Sam through the airport. Yeah, and when they head off to the airport, we have Jamie leaving the airport and finding Aurelia's dad. That's right. He decides he's going to go get Aurelia. And so this is where the story starts ping-ponging back and forth between these two story arcs. Right. So ultimately, Jamie goes to Aurelia's dad, says, I'm in love with your daughter. And he says, this one? And it's Uh, not that one. More fat shaming. And they take him to where she's working. I love the sister. Father Uh, father is about to sell Aurelia (laughs) as a slave to this Englishman. Yeah. I loved that part. (laughs) She's telling the whole family, so the whole family's coming along. And, and well, the whole town's coming along, really, because by the time they get to the restaurant where Aurelia is at, I mean, that, that place is pretty full, right? Mm. And then we're back to the airport, and Daniel and Sam, uh, you know, it, they are closing in, and then it's back to, you better not say yes. Shut up. <laughs> Shut up, Miss Dunkin' Donuts 2003, because they're at the restaurant. And then you're back to Daniel getting Sam through airport security. Right, and I, I and this is where I kind of thought Rowan Atkinson had a bigger part in this movie because just those two scenes, it's there's something about it that mm-hmm. seems just a little bit off. So I was wondering, I wonder if he popped up in other places, right, to guide our characters in the right he way, can. because he throws a defense and Sam's able to slip by and he gets into uh, he gets into the gate and chases after but Joanna. Did you also see after? Uh, Sam sneaks by. He gives Liam Neeson a kind of a little nod, wink. That yeah, he raises his eyebrows at that sure. it on purpose. Sure, yeah, uh, absolutely. I don't know why. And again, you could say that I don't believe in love or romance or whatever in this kind of movie. But this little kid sneaks through the airport, runs through the whole airport, breaking all of these laws. Now maybe things weren't as bad back then, or at least maybe they weren't as bad as in the UK. But he has. All of these security people chasing him, and he's jumping all around, and he's getting all everything, and finally they get to him, and what's the worst that happens to him? They release him to his dad, just let him go. Okay, one, it's a movie. Yeah. Two, it happened after, it was two years after September 11th, so no way would this ever have fucking happened. That's not a commitment. And three, it's a fucking movie. But I'm thinking at least, you know, the... They could have had him come pick up his kid from impound or something. Sure, we could have put him in handcuffs. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we could have uh, we could have hogtied would, his feet. Would have been all worth it for the yeah, kid. Yeah, absolutely. The kid's throwing probably, him in jail with yes. The kid's I agree. probably on the no fly zone, so he can never go visit the girl. Yes, in he's America. on the no fly list. He's a fucking terrorist. Yeah. Yes, but the music is so good here. How the the music is so good here. How it swells when when Sam bursts free. And and he's and he's running. It, it it's such it's so satisfying having the music swell the way that it does as he's you know making his way to the gate. And he tells Joanna that he loves her, 
and or that he likes her, and she says, "Cool." Well, we'll I love back. how she knew his name, and oh. that really meant and, something to him. And, and it always and it always kind of happens that way, right? He's all astonished. She goes, "You even know who the fuck I am?" And yeah. she's like, "Yes." And he's like, "Ooh," and his you know his ego gets a little bigger. I thought you didn't know my name. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And it was really cute when he gets finally released back to his dad, and she comes out and gives him a little kiss on the cheek. I thought she, that was adorable. She follows him out. Yeah. Again, never would have happened in an airport, but. Totally. Whatever. So we have uh, Joanna, the, 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 when she comes back to give him that kiss, how in the world, because the plane is leaving right now, The right? It, it, it's boarding right now. How right. in the world? It was the last call when he was even yeah. running. So how in the world could she come back? It's a fucking movie. I'm going to tell you the same thing I told well, her. Well, I kept thinking, how far did Sam run? I mean, he was running for a while across that airport, and she had just turned around and walked out and then walked back. Yeah. And the music was so triumphant when you have Daniel picking Sam up and they do the little Titanic spin. Oh, right, right, right. Because it's very Titanic-y, right? Mm-hmm. And then we have Jamie back at the restaurant and, you know, he's here to marry her. You can't. She's our best waitress. Right. And she says yes and they live happily ever after. I love how, you know, the, we figure out that while he's been learning to speak her language... She's, She's been, been learning, learning to, to speak, speak English. English. Yeah, yes. yeah, that, that's cute. Because so, she so sweet. had hoped he would come back. Now it's one month later, and we have all of our story arcs. It, it, it ends with everybody at the airport getting together. Yeah, just kind of like it began. Mm-hmm. Yep, you have Billy Mack, and then you have Jamie and Aurelia, where they meet Peter and Mark and Juliet. You have Harry and Karen. Oh, my gosh. <sighs> so heartbreaking. Daniel and Sam. They are meeting Joanna. John and Just Judy are also briefly spotted at the airport. Yeah, who just admit that they just got married so they could go home and shag. <laughs> and then you have <laughs> Colin showing up with Harriet and Carla, the sexy one. Right, uh, Denise Richards and Shannon Elizabeth. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And, and then we finally end with uh, Daniel, the prime minister, coming out and Natalie coming up and jumping onto his chest. I love the look he gives her like, whoa, <laughs> not here, not in front of the cameras, wait till we get home. All I keep thinking is if that whole thing happened in America, you know, nowadays, it would be this huge sex scandal in the news and he'd be, people would be telling him to resign. And That's because people are stupid. I think things are just better in the UK. Maybe. Maybe they're not as stupid. Okay. Who knows? And then we have all those little uh, greetings shown to us uh, happening at, at the airport. Well, the great yeah. thing about all these, the, you know, how it starts at the airport and ends at the airport is all of those scenes of people were all filmed via hidden cameras. So those are all actual people. You know, the, they caught those little scenes of love uh, from actual people. And from what I was reading is because they used a hidden camera, whenever the director found a scene that he liked or a couple he liked, he had to send people out to run and track those people down and get them quickly to sign waivers. Yeah. yeah, That's how that works. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I thought that was a clever idea. And then you kind of catch how it all forms a heart at the end. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Because, well, love actually. Roll credits. So I don't remember a story, like so many different stories going on crazy like this since, you know, I've watched the story of Aragorn and then Frodo over here and Bilbo over there and what were Pippin and Mary doing. Just so many different loving stories. Oh, shit. And now it's time for John's... Moment. This is the point in the podcast where I compare the movie we are currently reviewing to the greatest movie series ever made, Lord of the Rings. But this week, we'd have so many Frodo's, so many Sam's, so many Gandalf's, Sauron, etc. For each story, it would just be a big old mess. So as an early Christmas present to you, Don and Ken, I won't be doing that this week. Well, with one exception... The One Ring. In Love Actually, the One Ring is represented by love, actually. Basically, how love is used for good and bad, how it grows and how it is abused. In some stories, it's shown as a positive force used to make lives better. In other stories, love is shown as a hurtful weapon to tear folks down. And there you have it. 
my comparison of Love Actually and Lord of the Rings. Fuck those grades. All right. I love it. And that was John's. Moment. What do you guys think? You guys ready to rate this flick? Yeah, I'm ready to rate this flick. What about you, John? You ready to rate this flick? You could jingle my bells all day and you won't get me more excited about it. Okay. Okay. That's a good one. I like that. Uh, Professor, how do we do our ratings? We do our ratings on a scale of one to five fucks. Five fucks is a movie that we think is cinematic gold. A one fuck movie is you've seen it and you're probably, no, you're never going to watch it again. And what's a zero? A zero fuck movie is you get done watching it and you're like, oh, for shit's sake. What the hell? Who made me? Why did you make me watch? I want two hours and 15 minutes of my life back. Or in other words, we just don't give a fuck. All right, Professor, your movie, your pick. Love Actually is a movie that I have seen several times. The stories, I think, are strong. And it's amazing that you have so many story arcs that are able to be, that you're able to follow along with them. The fact that you have a who's who for Great Britain, uh, I, I think, is a lot of fun. The characters in general are very likable. The highs are high. The lows are very low. And I really enjoy how the movie has the music weaving the stories together from time to time. And I think it is a definite uh, strong selling point of the movie is how well the music works with it. The stories that um, I think are a little lighter is uh, the the John and Jess Judy. It's it's a tender story of of innocence and love. The Billy Mac story. He's he's not necessarily all all that strong, but he's a very likable character. That he's he's so much fun that I didn't really necessarily care that much that his story arc isn't necessarily all that strong. It was very satisfying to have. The, uh, the David and Natalie story, I think it's classic Hugh Grant here. And Emma Thompson, I thought that her story was incredibly uh, powerful as well. In the end, I'm giving this movie 4.25 fucks. 4.25 fucks from The Professor. Okay, I'll go. Uh, Love, actually, I thought for a movie that had eight, stories that intertwined into one did a pretty good job i love the who's who of the uh english actors uh emma thompson hugh grant liam neeson etc i thought they all did a great job and i all think they whenever they are in a movie they all bring their a games i don't think there was an actor in this film that i did not enjoy that being said I felt that the filmmakers did a good job of taking these eight stories and connecting them. And I guess if you, if someone said, what was the true or what was the actual story of love? Actually, it was love. Actually, Uh, as far as a Christmas movie, I think this is more of a romantic movie that is uh, taking place at Christmas time. But yes, does definitely fall in the Christmas movie category. Uh, Isn't my top five? No. Isn't my top 10? Probably not. Is it a good movie? Yes. Um, So with those reasons, I'm giving Love Actually 2.75 fucks. Would that make it my turn? That's your turn, buddy. Before I go. Two fucks. Is that your final answer? Yes. Love Actually. This movie starts with five weeks till Christmas. And in that five weeks, a guy catches his girlfriend with his brother only to propose to another woman in another country. Another man sparks possibly a new romance after losing his wife to a terminal illness. Another messes with his best friend's marriage by letting it out that he's in love with the best friend's new wife and so on, all with a subtle Christmas theme. Personally, I felt the writing was a little sloppy. There was so much that was so far-fetched, it really took me out of the movie, like a kid who breaks so many laws running through an airport, and we're to believe that the British security folks just handed him off to his dad with no worries. Any one of those stories could have been a focus of an entire movie, and likely better portrayed, but instead... We get what felt to me like was a five-week rushed mess that was most likely best defined as a rebound relationship. I don't blame the actors. I felt for the most part 
they did a great job. They were the best part of the movie. I really appreciated the casting. The movie really had a fun group of actors. And it did remind me, though, how annoying Hugh Grant could be. So I gave it one or minus one point just even for his dance scene. And Alan Rickman, I always love Alan Rickman, but he was so underutilized in this movie that I just felt like it was a big lump of coal in my stocking. I think Billy Mack summed up the movie best when he said, this is a solid gold shit. Okay, well, maybe that's a little harsh. The movie did have quite a few laughs and a few ah moments, but overall, it just wasn't my cup of tea. So for those reasons, I'm giving love actually two fucks. With 2.75 fucks from yours truly, 4.25 fucks from Ken, and two fucks from the comic book guy, which gives Love Actually an average of three fucks, which puts it into the number 23 spot, tied with The Running Man, The Wolf of Wall Street, and Flash Gordon. It is slightly better than The NeverEnding Story, The Last Dragon, Tommy Boy, and Solo, A Star Wars Story, and slightly worse than Catch Me If You Can, Bloodsport, and The Last Samurai. All right, that is going to wrap it up for this episode of Three Guys in a Flick. If you would like to know which episode we are going to be reviewing next, please check out our website. Speaking of which, John, where can they find us? They can find us at www.3guysinaflick.com, where we go ahead and post all of our podcasts, show notes, and, well, anything else we feel like putting there. You also can fill out a form there that you could submit what movie you would like us to review next. Get your movie choice into that Bronco helmet. And as Don mentioned... We don't have a whole lot of holiday movies in there. So if you have some ideas for whatever holidays movies we should do, like Valentine's Day's coming up, put your picks in there and maybe we'll review them. You can also find us at all of social media as well as every place that posts our host podcasts. All right. I just want to thank Zach, Ronnie, and Jill for listening. Keep on listening. Thanks, Zach. Thanks, Ronnie. Thanks, Jill. And I want to thank anyone else who has suggested a movie and who listens. If you keep listening, we'll keep recording. For Three Guys in a Flick, I'm Don. I'm John. And I'm Ken. Thanks for listening and happy holidays. Hey, you kids, here's an important message from your Uncle Bill. Don't buy drugs. Become a pop star, and they'll give them to you for free. I, I still don't know who David is. Okay, she's the housekeeper. She's the one that can't speak English. His name's Jamie. Is it? I yeah, don't know. I and, and her name is Aurelia. Oh, I don't know. I strike that question. You think? A little bit of lovableness. Lovable. Try it again. That would get him another date. <laughs> One thing I forgot to mention earlier, uh, when we were talking about uh, Sam and Liam Neeson's character, what is his name? Hannibal Smith. <laughs> yeah, and, and just the master of the detail, right? You know, mm. God forbid they be porn stars. Um, don't you, don't you go on one. See? Oh, now it's okay? All right, so, what do you got? So it was, it was Ken's pick. He's got the first dibs at the porn name. All right, Ken, let us have it. I got nothing. <sighs> Party pooper. This it, one's so obvious. It it really is. Ready? Let's do it at the same time. And we have no idea what we're each other's gonna say. Ready? One, two, three. Lust, lust actually. actually. Yeah. I also thought it could be lust actively. Oh, I like that. Or uh lick actively. Mm-hmm. One of the two. Yeah. Look, he's turning red. All right. I would love to sit here and do this with you all day, but I gotta go to work. All right, may all of your uh, days and nights be filled with happiness. All right, fuck off, good night. <laughs>